used to have exam boards when I was in the psychology department and there was one year where a student uh, gave an excuse for a uh, low mark uh, that their grandparent had died and the external examiner who was a psychologist said hmm grandparent I'm not sure that's traumatic if it had been the parent yes uh, now, this is the problem that we have, that we're using a category and telling people when and when they're not allowed to talk about trauma. Where I, my argument is that we need to take seriously how people are using trauma. It may be in the course of describing what they experience that they think, yeah, okay, maybe it wasn't so traumatic, but I think we have to give people the space to talk about it and think about it for themselves rather than a psychiatrist or a psychologist telling them yeah. what they should and, or shouldn't and feel. And I do, and I definitely, I'm sympathetic. I don't want to draw boundaries and say this is traumatic and this isn't. I definitely am sympathetic to your um, people should be able to narrate their own trauma um, and recognize their own trauma. I am definitely sympathetic to that perspective. And actually I do buy that. I still worry that if people left to their own devices are able to use that term and use that framing for something which um, uh, then means they're not able to exercise emotional resilience, I mean other types of coping mechanisms which are actually dampened down because of their framing it as traumatic, that's my worry, is that, um, that we're seeing a reduction in resilience of, of young people. And I see this in my students, crikey, I'm so worried about them. The levels of anxiety, depression, um, uh, they feel very traumatized by things. And I don't want to tell them it's not trauma, but I'm seeing them, they're not making friends, they're staying inside. Like they're, I'm worried about their emotional landscape and I'm worried that their labeling is actually actually impeding their capacity to build resilience and that's the point I'm trying to make rather than force things into categories. Do you think you can spot resilience on a brain scan? You up? Can you spot resi resilience on a brain scan? Oh, well, I love this question. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, just, I, was thinking, you know, I love a brain scan. Psychoanalysis can kill you off the I chain. I love a brain scan. <laughs> no. so, um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, just going to bring it back to the brain. So, yeah, so, so great. <laughs> so enthusiastic about your subject. <laughs> so we can definitely see trauma in the brain. You know, this is why this is where I started with. This is the brain scan. This signal. is the brain scan. <laughs> 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 it's it's bang on cue. <laughs> it's coming. So yeah. So when I would scan people with um, who had suffered traumas, like, and then you would see um, an area called the amygdala, was hyperactive. Um, that's an area that's involved. Yes, fear, but general salience is part of the limbic network. You would see hyper um, or altered activation of the uh, hippocampus, which is an area involved in memory. You'd see loads and loads and loads of activation in the insula, my favorite brain region, which is involved in the sensing of bodily physiology, so the racing heart, the autonomic responses that you see with trauma, and you see a reduction or altered activity in the VMPFC, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which is an area involved in regulation. Um, and this is what you classically see in people that have had a trauma um, uh, episode and they're finding it hard to uh, regulate their emotional reactions to it. And so conversely, um, resilience will be seeing um, a greater engagement of controlled areas in the brain which are able to dampen down and inhibit this emotional reaction. So prefrontal cortex. And actually, you can see that the white matter tract between the VMPFC and the amygdala, the integrity of that tract predicts the degree to which you um, have anxiety symptoms, the idea being that if that tract is, is better, you are more resilient and you're more able to regulate these things. And yeah. I can't even remember why I was <laughs> well, telling yeah. this. I got <laughs> distracted. My original question yeah. was, you know, can you define resilience on a brain yeah, yeah, scan? So you but can see, I'm yeah. going to have to ask for a glossary of terms for this. <laughs> okay, I'm so sorry. But yes, you we can. We need sir titles. <laughs> yeah. well, for me, anyway. And resilience is very much linked to the activation of these prefrontal areas, which is involved in control, control of emotion, um, regulation. And I worry that if people are spending too much time talking about their trauma um, and exploring the emotions attached to it, I'm worried they're not engaging enough 
this circuitry or they're loading too much on this emotional reaction and they're not able to build up the resilience in the same way. Words can frame the emotional reactions in the brain. So can any of the three of you envisage a way in which these remarkable discoveries can change or do something about this to use your word, the dangerous seepage of, tra of seepage of history, you know. Can we use these scientific insights to actually reach out and touch the psychoanalytic insights, about to meet somewhere clinically useful to change the way we go forwards? I think we have to take this point that you raised about the, uh, the power of words very, very seriously. And we need to think about the ways in which our brain is an incredibly plastic organ that the brain chemistry and the brain structure changes according to what's happened to us. It's not simply that the brain is ticking away and then doing things and then we behave in certain kinds of ways. It's as much the other way around as well. And I think we need to conceptualize these scans that you use as the basis of your research, not only in terms of what has happened before events, but also to conceptualize how people's experience then has an effect on their brain structure, which then shows up in the scans. That's my first caution, my first worry, uh, that, that it's a more complicated relationship between the two than a simple causal effect, a biological effect, working its way out into practice. And my, my other worry is that these scans require, require a great deal of interpretation, and that's what you're skilled in. You're skilled in reading these scans and reading scans that have already been in, interpreted in the process of injecting the chemicals and working out what bits light up where, okay? If you put, there was a lovely experiment a few years ago where a group of uh, neuroscientists brought um, a frozen North Atlantic salmon in oh, the yeah, fMRI <laughs> scanner and they were able to show that the frozen North Atlantic salmon in the scanner engaged with the task. No, they didn't uh, no, engage, but, but, but they but, had but activated voxels. What it voxels. shows is that there's a degree, <laughs> there's a big degree of uncertainty, uh, which is we fill in the gaps in our interpretation, and we need to be careful about where those interpretations come from. So, to, although I agree with you that you made some valid points, there's definitely a difference in the brain for people who have had some of these very traumatic events versus those who have not um, had these sort of medically um, classified traumatic events. So that is definitely true and not up for interpretation. But I want to come to a different point. I want to come to the point of behavioral activation. And my understanding of it, it's about um, treatments for depression um, uh, and, and pain and other things by making the outside world more engaging. So it's taking a focus away from self and onto the world. Um, and these things are shown to have a positive effect. And I take from this, and our brains oscillate between internal processing and external processing. Um, and this comes back to yeah, your sentence about you know, self-reflection, that if we spend too much time focusing on self, analyzing self, analyzing trauma, then we're activating these circuits which are very much implicated in depression and anxiety, and it becomes reinforcing. And one way you can help people is get them out of themselves focus on the world, focus on helping someone, focus on, you know, an interesting lecture, focus on something else, and they'll start to, they can start to feel better again. And it's a, they can, I had the word can, I had the word can. But I <laughs> but want to know, did yeah. the salmon feel better? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm worried about the salmon. <laughs> yeah, the, the salmon got caught. That's yeah. dramatic. What happened, <laughs> what happened to the salmon? This is the yeah. question. <laughs> And it was a problem because the salmon was dead. <laughs> so the fact that there were was a, a couple process. of voxels was a bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then it was. But it's a long. It's a long story. And uh, yeah. but no, it's very different from what I do. <laughs> I don't. I don't do fish. <laughs> to continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below, or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.